Welcome back to the Canuckonomicon. I am your host extraordinary, Benjamin Jr. Wandio. I am joined here by my fantastic super producer um, and person who donated half his DNA to produce me, um, Todd Dirty Clad Wandio. Salutations. <laughs> well, everyone, we're here for episode five of season two today, and uh, today I am drinking Collective Arts Rhubarb Hibiscus Gin. Oh, delicious. Yes. Are, are uh, you getting a perk from them? Uh, no, it's just freaking delicious. Okay. <laughs> um, the liquor store that just opened up down the block from my house got it in their first week they were open. They got four cases thinking four cases should do within the first weekend sold out. So they got another four cases in yesterday. I go in with my friend today. They're down to a case and a half. You have a friend? I have a friend, my I'm, friend Connor. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> yes, I had my uh, friends Connor and Mariah over for uh, dinner last night. So oh, okay. we went and bought some fancy gin. It's like $60 a bottle. This is not cheap stuff. <laughs> um, but it is delicious it's one of the only gins i can drink straight there's not many i can do that with oh really most just taste like liquid fire (laughs) i can drink almost anything straight well that's your gift so (laughs) Uh, i haven't tried gasoline yet but (laughs) are you sure i've uh i've had some of that cheap beer you've bought in the past what was that firehouse beer we had that was nasty i never even tried that i still have a bottle in the fridge I dare you to no, try it today. No, you know, no, because it's a darker beer and it gives me a headache. So, <laughs> plus it's November uh, and I'm trying to be a little abstinent this November. Oh, well, I see. What do they call that? No beer November. I thought it was Movember, and you're supposed to grow facial hair. No oh, shave I'm November. That. I'm doing that too. I, I do that know. all the time. Yeah, but you know, I'm not uh I'm not a purist. Like I'm not stuck on not drinking. I'm just choosing right now not to have much. I don't know. I don't know. It's also 8 in the morning, so you probably shouldn't be drinking anyways. <sighs> no, but you know, like the night before, I just no. <laughs> All right, everyone. So, I've got for us today Uh, A topic that came to me by way of my beautiful wife. Um, Just off the top, I'm going to give you some of the sources that we'll be using for this episode. Well, I'm going to give you the source for this episode. And this will be a two-parter. Our next episode, I'll give you the sources for that one later. Um, But today's main source is Leonard W. Taylor's 1983 book, The Sourdough and the Queen, The Many Lives... Of Klondike, Joe Boyle. So, according to Taylor, um, the Boyle family claims to be descended from the English adventurer Richard Boyle, uh, who landed in Ireland with the Armana in 5088, and who through his own wits and fiery spirit raised himself up to the position of Earl of Cork. The Boyle family's history in Canada, however, starts much later. Just before the mass migration brought on by famine in Ireland, the Buckna Boyles, as they were known, uh, moved to Upper Canada at a time when it was still sparsely populated, and this was just following the War of 1812 with the United States. Uh, The brother was David Boyle, who was an Anglo-Irish Protestant who would go on to marry Martha Baines, a Scottish woman whose family we don't know as much about. Charles Boyle, um, which was David Boyle's son, uh, eventually made a lot of money in breeding horse uh, racehorses. Uh, so him 
or yeah, he was uh, pretty well off. They had four children, David, Charles, Joseph, and Susan. Um, Joseph was unique in that he was a quote unquote confederation child born on November 6th, 1867, which was five months after Canada confederated into a semi-independent country under the rule of the monarchs of England. Um, (laughs) as, uh, we know, uh, the whole country didn't finish confederating until like well into the sixties, I think with some of the maritime provinces. Mm, uh, no, it wasn't that late. 49 was the last one, which was, 49. uh, Newfoundland. That's right. So it would take, uh, almost a hundred years for Canada to fully unite into a single country, but in 1867 this is the first time that the idea of canada as a separate country is first kind of coming about yeah the, uh the important provinces showed yeah. up <laughs> well did they even because in 1867 no. it was still upper and lower canada it wasn't yeah, even ontario yeah. and quebec yet mm, upper lower canada um rupert's land i don't even know if no there, they were calling there, it the Northwest Territory by that point, I think. No, I, I don't. No? I don't think they were included. Um, oh, it, uh, PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Yeah, I think that was about it. Even BC yeah. hadn't joined. Um, so then Alberta and Saskatchewan joined in 1905, I believe. Oh, Ma- mm, Manitoba. Manitoba. Uh, was no, just kind of a tiny the, little province. The first challenge of the new government yeah. w- was uh, the to go north to the northwest uh, northwest mounted police. Yeah, right to send them, uh, s- send them to break up the whiskey trade. That's right, uh, Fort Whoopa. Um Yeah, they were uh, police officers. Yes. Quote, unquote. Uh, they not yet. Originally, well, the prime minister was originally going to ask for what he called mounted pistols. Right. Which a lot of nerds will know is a dragoon, a type of mounted officer who would have a carbine or pistol as a primary weapon. The idea is that you would ride on your horse out to the battlefield, dismount, and then engage in combat. Um, but they didn't want to, because they just... Like, the, the War of 1812 was still quite fresh in a lot of people's minds. They didn't want to uh, spook the, the Americans. Or provoke the Americans. Right. Because we also had the Finian issue at this point. So, because of the Irish War of Independence that's going on, uh, the IRA, um, they were, uh, they invaded Canada twice. And by they, I mean it was like, a handful, twelve guys, <laughs> twelve IRA guys on, members on a bender. <laughs> 12 guys yeah, it was like bender. it was like twelve, twelve <laughs> Irish guys invaded Canada from the United States. Yeah, um, which is part of what actually drove Confederation, <laughs> because there was fear of a new American invasion after the War of eighteen twelve, and because right. of the Finians in the states uh, coming over, fighting for the IRA. Um they realized that they need to be able to raise their own troops and they couldn't rely on England to keep sending troops over, especially with stuff that was going on in Europe at the time. Right. We were so, in dominion of Canada in 1867. Yeah, that's right. Um, so they wanted to get police or somebody to go out and break up the whiskey trade, the whiskey smuggling that was going on in the Northwest territories, which at this time was most of Western Canada. Um, they wrote to England requesting quote unquote mounted police officers, which is where the idea of the Mounties first came from. Right. <laughs> so, but that's a whole episode because there was all sorts of weird stuff that went on with that, that I will probably cover in the future. Um, but the point is, this is the time we're looking at the uh, birth of Joseph Boyle. Um, we don't know precisely when 
Joseph or any of his siblings were born. Uh, There was no records of their birth, as it wasn't legally compulsory at the time to register your children at birth. Um, Normally, we would have records through baptisms. And Charles Boyle, the father, was a staunch Anglican. But when we search records in the Toronto area... Uh, nobody's actually, at least in 1983, and as far as I know, there hasn't been any more recent scholarship on this. Uh, nobody was really able to yield results to find out when precisely the Boyle family's children were born um, or baptized. But we do know it was 1867. Um, Joseph grew up in a small farming community uh, around Ontario. Um, And even at this young age, at least according to Joe Boyle himself, his wit was already becoming quite apparent. Uh, One day, his father demanded to know how his son was doing in the small one-room school he was attending. Joe waited a few moments quietly before replying, Quite well, I'm second in my class. (laughs) So his dad asked him, How many are in your class? (laughs) Joe shot back. Two, me and Peter Duncan. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I spoiled your uh, setup. Oh, no, you saw it coming. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I would have told my dad. (laughs) How are you doing? Well, I'm... That uh, sounds about right. I'm in the top (laughs) ten. I'm in the top... Oh, good for you, son, good for you. Yeah, there's only ten of us. (laughs) <laughs> that was my athletic um, ev- career yeah. eventually the Boyle kids were sent to uh, Beale Street School which was known for having a no nonsense ed- education where basically it's main draws were that it taught your kids how to read write and spell um, uh, at this time Joe had a close brush with the icy hands of death when skating on thin ice, which was apparently something that was considered a fun pastime, skating what they called rubber ice. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I can I imagine you can see how this went. Joe fell through the ice. Uh, one of his friends came out with a, a whacking and stick and pulled him out of the hole. Um. And as a result, it was becoming increasingly clear that Joe Boyle had inherited his family's reputation for adventure and daring do. Uh, Charles Boyle, his father, was known also quite well for um, being kind of a boisterous, outspoken individual. And, you know, he was a fun Irishman. So, he, Charles's family, pretty well known for their outgoing ways. Um, Charles and Martha in particular, so uh, Joe's mother, um, had designs that all three sons would follow what they thought of as the three great professions. Uh, law, medicine, and pastoral ministry. It was clear, however, that none of their sons was interested in following their preordained careers. Uh, Charles Boyle was perfectly fine with this so long as they all avoided horse racing and the gambling that was involved in it, ironically considering that Charles was a horse breeder for racetracks. Joe managed to frustrate even that. He actually moved to live in New York after some years and even began learning the ropes of horse husbandry from his dad. Uh, It was clear to everyone that he lived with in his home in New York, uh, which included his uh, older brother, David, 
um, that Joe had eyes for only one mistress, the sea. So in 1884, Joseph Boyle signed on with the bark known as the Wallace, uh, being only at the time 16 or 17 years old, and sailed away to make his fortune. The work was apparently hard and grueling. He wrote home so infrequently that there came to be a rumor that he was actually dead, <laughs> that he was lost at sea. <laughs> That's that rudimentary education, hard at work. <laughs> well, that that's the thing. Uh, they, yeah, Joseph Boyle was actually quite well educated. He did some time at a seminary, mm-hmm. um, but he ended up kind of quitting part way through. When... Um, as far as I know, most of his family went on to higher education, just not the careers that the parents wanted for them. Yeah, well, not to mention when you're at sea, I mean, it can take two years for a letter to get home. Yeah. Um, and he was he was gone for quite a while. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, he actually almost did become lost at sea, as the bark Wallace was very nearly lost in a storm. Joe Boyle and others claimed that it was the teenage country boy from rural Ontario who rallied the men to pump the quickly flooding bilge as a storm wailed around them. The mainmast had split in two, and it may well have been Joe Boyle that rallied the crew. Regardless of who it was, uh, to work they went, and the Wallace was able to limp into port in India where it received repairs. This day actually changed Boyle's life. It was the most exciting and harrowing experience he had ever had. He came to believe that as long (laughs) as men were working hard enough, uh, nothing was ever truly lost. Um, He had earned the respect of both his captain and crew during this storm and actually began receiving a naval education from the captain, uh, learning navigation and seamanship. Uh, He was well-liked, charismatic. He had kind of a folksy Irish charm that people liked about him. He even supposedly once got in a knife fight with a shark to save an overboard crewman once. (laughs) (laughs) Apparently some of the crew was horsing around and uh, one of the guys fell overboard. um, And they were laughing initially until they realized that the guy was having... A really hard time staying afloat. Um, And then they saw a fin coming towards the guy above the water. And they realized there was a shark in the water. So Joe Boyle (laughs) grabbed his knife and dove into the water. Not waiting for the rescue boat. And went over and held off the shark until the boat got in the water. So they could pull the guy aboard. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, if you read uh, uh, Moby Dick, for instance, which uh, I think is a pretty realistic uh, depiction, other than the obsession that Ahab has with this whale, uh, pretty uh, accurate depiction of life on a whaling boat, for instance. Yeah. And the risks that people took, you know, I mean... It's not like today where everything is so safety oriented that there's almost no risk to anything you do. No, I, I, except <clears throat> at sea where a lot of risk is still taken. You look at things like the Alaskan crab fishing boats where they're working, you know, 20 hour days and getting four hours of sleep. Yeah, you know. Well, because they're in a rush <laughs> to get all the crates in before the storm season hits. That's right, but I also think some of that is um, because it's on television. Uh, (laughs) I'm willing to bet that they skirt safety standards in order to make it more exciting. I'm even thinking back to before the show started because I remember there was that the show was spawned off another show. Right. It was uh, most dangerous jobs, and it was considered the number one most dangerous job because one person died almost every season. Yeah. Um. And then, obviously, that got people's attention rather right. than minesweepers. So, 
uh, they ended up making a reality show based around it. But it, it makes sense that you're trying to get these crates in at the last possible minute because you want as many crabs in as possible. But you've also got to get them in before the storms hit, the winter storms. And so it's, it's I can, it, you know, you can see. But even that is nothing compared to what it was like back in 18, the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, I guess it was 1880s at this point, so the Victorian era, um, when they're still using sailboats. They're not even using steamships yet. Yeah. So, you know, it's a dangerous time to be at sea, for sure. Well, any time is a dangerous time, but for sure in those days, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, these traits would carry Joe Boyle through his entire life, and that, along with the likely sizable amount of cash, although according to legend it was his important role in putting down a mutiny, Joe Boyle who left New York aboard the Wallace as a simple deckhand, returned as first mate and part owner of a schooner named Susan in 1887. <laughs> so he'd been at sea for three years. Okay. Um, Joe's family was mighty surprised that he was still alive. Uh, they were apparently appalled that he walked from uh, through what they called Dockland in New York with pockets full of money and demanded he go deposit that money in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were very impressed with the nice clothes that he had bought in England and horrified by his unkempt hair. And so Dave Boyle, Joe's oldest brother, saw to it that Joe was cleaned up and made presentable. As soon as he got home. Yeah. First thing he did. Um, so Joe, who had left sea a boy, had returned a tanned, rugged young man with several years of adventuring and sailing experience under his belt. Aww. Dave. Oh, go ahead. No, no. Aw. <laughs> Dave Boyle uh, then made a terrible miscalculation. Um, he introduced the young Joe Boyle to a beautiful young divorcee with a son whom Dave was interested in without telling Joe that he wanted to marry her. Oh, no. <laughs> Joe, you see, was a very charming young man. He was around 19 years old, and Joe Boyle found out what color Mildred Rayner, the name of this woman uh, that he was going to meet, would be wearing. So he bought her a bouquet of flowers that matched her dress. Uh, Millie Rayner was absolutely entranced by the charming, rugged seaman known as Joe Boyle. Uh, he quickly married her. Uh, Dave Boyle was utterly heartbroken. And Joe's parents never really got over the fact that Millie was a divorcee. Uh, they were, you know, Victorian older people. And so the idea of marrying a divorced woman, especially one who was slightly older than Joe, um, given how young Joe was at the time, they, they weren't thrilled with the arrangement. But Joe was as happy as could be. He was now married to a slightly older woman with very expensive tastes and an inherited son to boot. So he sold his shares in the Susan and set about investing in business so that he could keep his new family afloat. Um, Millie had a love of furs that earned her the pet name Mink. <laughs> Joe needed money. Um, and so uh, he actually attempted studying law. He went to night school for a time. Sorry for the stuff he knows. Um, he went to night school for a time to to study law and... According to some of his teachers, he was a quick learner, but he ended up dropping it because he needed kind of more immediate cash because his wife liked nice stuff. Uh, and he now, at this point, had two houses he was maintaining, one in New York and another one in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, so Joe went to one of his other favorite pastimes. As a sailor, Joe had uh, become something of a boxer, and he was quite good at it, and was also really good at promoting himself as a boxer. And so he became the manager of a boxing club, 
where he met the Sydney slasher from New South Wales, Frank mm-hmm. P. Slavin. In 1891, Frank, who was 30 years old and just past the peak of his career, began tutoring Joe in boxing and apparently other topics. Through this, Joe ended up working as a boxing and racing writer for the New York World Paper. Uh, Joe used this position and leveraged it to act as a boxing promoter for Frank Slavin, uh, pushing him to get a world title chance. Um, He didn't end up getting it, but he was part of some serious bouts. And uh, with his brothers, who had gone on to work in the horse breeding business with their father, uh, also managed to win an 8-to-1 $56,000 gamble on a horse race by managing to train and raise a horse in secret so that the odds against it would be very high. (laughs) They used this to buy their mother a house uh, in the country, which, remember, they were farmers for a time, and she had managed a farming estate. Apparently, she had mentioned in passing to her kids that she liked this house. It turns out that she... Liked looking at it, but had no desire to live there. So they bought her this very nice farmhouse. Um, She took it like a champ, moved all her staff and everything there, and swore all her workers to secrecy to not tell her son or husbands, or her sons or husband, that she hated it. (laughs) She had no desire to continue uh, managing a farming estate, but her kids had gone through so much work to get her this place that she couldn't bear to tell them right up to the day she died that she hated living there. (laughs) Well, the long-suffering Victorian mother. (laughs) Um, The house is currently uh, a hamburger stand. (laughs) <laughs> when she died the house was liquidated it was sold and torn down sometime in the 20th century at least in 1983 when this book was written it was a hamburger stand there you go. Um, this was known as the furs i believe it was in new jersey um on the 1st of December, 1897, Joe Boyle finally made a fate, fateful move that would forever cement his name in the annals of Canadian history as Joe Klondike Boyle. Um, after months and months and months of preparation, uh, he ended up moving back into Canada, especially into eastern Canada. Uh, where he would enter into secret meetings in Ottawa and Montreal. Um, Joe Boyle and his now friend and now retired boxer, Frank Slavin, uh, began working on a business venture that would change the face of the territories. So, I don't know if the year is telling you anything and the name, but this is the year of the Klondike Gold Rush. What was the year again? 18... Uh, 1897. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So this is the 1st of December, 1897. Um, short on cash, again, which was something Joe Boyle was pretty familiar with. He was actually... Uh, a lot of people were quite uncomfortable with him because he really liked living on credit. <laughs> he was... Very comfortable taking credit and very comfortable giving credit to people, which apparently ran him into some trouble because he did work as a book uh, bookie for a while. Um, but he needed money because, again, his wife, very expensive tastes. Um, and so he stayed in the Klondike in August and September to scout out what would become known as the Boyle Concession. The Boyle Concession was a large chunk of land in the Klondike that was basically signed over to uh, Joe Boyle and Frank P. Slavin to work as gold miners. Um, Leonard Taylor goes into a huge amount of detail on the workings of this arrangement, who precisely he had to meet with, um, 
exactly what was involved in what he did. But the long and short of it is, is that uh, he got in there after kind of the initial placer miners. So you know what placer mining is? No, I'm assuming it's the guys that uh, make the steak. Yeah, so uh, placer mining is the process of getting what's called alluvial gold. Alluvial gold is that gold that you get out of creek beds and rivers. It's the kind of little small granules of gold that get mixed in with uh, sand and gravel. Um, normally, when we think of placer mining, we are thinking of those guys who go into the creek beds, scoop up a bunch of dirt and rinse it off in the creek um, until they find those little specks and use that to kind of track down a, a big hit. Um And that's kind of the smaller end of it. That's the prospectors, right? So they'll go out and then they'll sell their claims to people like Joe Boyle. So Joe Boyle's job was basically uh, is he brought up what were called dredgers. So you can get small dredgers now, kind of like like the size of a table. Operations, you mean? Yeah. So he brought in what were called these dredgers. So nowadays you can get a small dredger off of Amazon. And mm-hmm. it's basically about the size of a table. It's uh, kind of like a sloped slide. It's got a bunch of ribs in it. And you'll pour your gravel and sand and rinse it off. The idea is that gold is much denser than the materials that make up gravel and sand. And so the gold will actually settle out first when it's mixed with water. And so what you'll end up with on these little kind of ribs on these dredges is you'll get little specks of gold. Well, what Slavin and uh, Joe Boyle were doing is they had industrial sized ones. These things were enormous and they had a large bucket uh, bucket scoop on the side that would basically dig up the creek beds, dig up the mountainside, dump it out on top, and then they would just redirect a river over it and rinse it all out until you all you had left was the gold and that's how joe boyle made his fortune was he brought up these huge dredgers from places like ottawa and montreal all the way up into the yukon um Mm -hmm. and he was one of the first guys to do this and so he managed to get quite a bit of money doing this and, and became very wealthy and changed the face of how mining was done in the Yukon. Uh, to this day, um, the Yukon is a very mineral rich uh, territory. It's not a province. It's a territory. I don't really, it's a difference in how they're managed. I think, I think the territories are more directly managed by the federal government, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't. Really I wish I could give you guys a civics lesson on how that works, but I don't actually know. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do some research. I don't. I don't know that that was ever made a uh, topic. I mean, I. I didn't even. I taught the stuff, and I still can't tell you what the difference is. <laughs> um, but the Yukon is still very mineral rich. That's one of its primary industries is mining, though nowadays they kind of go for quote unquote baser metals like copper and steel. There are still you huge know. gold mining operations in the Yukon. Diamonds, there absolutely are. Yeah. Gold, diamonds. Uh, yeah. I think the Northwest Territory sees a few more of the diamond operations. There are some in the Yukon, but I think most of them are in the, the Northwest Territories. Uh, both territories are in are like bare Canadian shield. Yeah. So, but I think because uh, most uh, diamond mines are located on tops of uh, old volcanoes, right? Because um, that's where the copper will build or the copper, the carbon will build up uh, in the old pipes, and so they're always looking for those old volcanic pipes. Right. Um. But and there's a few more of those in the north. I think I think you're right. I think there are some in the Yukon, but I think the big ones are in the Northwest Territories. Um, but the Yukon, yeah, still has quite a impressive gold industry, though it's not at the point that it was at the beginning of the Klondike Gold Rush. Um, yeah. So this is how Joe Boyle got 
big, made his own fortune. Keeping in mind that Joe Boyle was a man from money. He didn't get the large concessions and he didn't just rise he like he wasn't risen out of poverty to do this. He he came from racing money. Yeah. Um and so he had connections and was able to get these concessions. Um and he did this so that he could, you know, get more than just a few bearded dwarfs with gold pans and pickaxes up into the wilderness. <laughs> I mean, he, he built these enormous dredges um, and basically changed the industry in the Yukon during the Klondike Gold Rush. And, and is probably part of what made it the Gold Rush. Uh, he was so successful and beat down his competitors so well that he became known as the King of the Klondike. He was a very wealthy man. <laughs> um, he lived in Dawson city. Do you know where Dawson city is? Mm -hmm. It's a little more isolated than Whitehorse, but it's, it's up there. Yeah. Um, and he became enamored with this local sport that was just booming in Dawson City at the time. That sport was hockey. Really? Your favorite topic. Yeah, I love hockey. I didn't realize How... anyone was playing it up in Dawson. <laughs> yeah. How much do you know about the Stanley Cup Challenge era? No, uh, you mean the original six and their first yeah. game? Uh, between the Ottawa Senators and... Oh, this it? is before the Ottawa Senators. This is back in no, the no, times no. of the uh, Ottawa Silver 7. The the 67s, you mean? The Silver 7s. Oh, is that what you're calling them? No, I that's think, what that's what they're called. <laughs> I thought the this... first Stanley Cup game was between the Ottawa 67s, which was the... would became the Senators. Like... Well, there, there might have... A hundred years later... <laughs> yeah, at this time it was held by a, a group called the Ottawa Silver Sevens. Okay. Um, and so uh, the idea of how this would work, this isn't like it is now with the NHL. There was no organized league, right? So we're we're kind of looking at more like how like wrestling and boxing belts are handed off. You bring your team out to the current holders of the cup and you challenge them to a game and you play the game. And if you win, you now have the cup. Huh. There's no playoffs. There's no, you know, preseason. No. There's no season yeah. <laughs> other than can you get to somewhere with ice? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You arrange the game. Yep. And uh, I'm going to remind you again, Joe Boyle was a fantastic sports promoter. Didn't know a shit about hockey, but he was a great sports promoter. <laughs> um, and Joe Boyle felt that the team in Dawson City, there was a couple teams, but the, the players in Dawson City had the makings of a Stanley Cup holding team. Uh, and so he named them the Yukon Nuggets and devised a plan to challenge the Ottawa Silver Sevens for the Stanley Cup. <laughs> so let's keep in mind, these guys are in Dawson City, Yukon. Ottawa is over 4,000 miles away. <laughs> And, uh, I don't, is the, the railroad, the railroad's finished. That'll play okay. into this. So, so they can, they can get West, but they have to get South first. Uh, no, South North. They no they, because they're in Dawson city. So to play oh, Ottawa, he's got to get his people to, he's Ottawa. got to get okay. his people to Ottawa. Right. To challenge for the cup. <laughs> to challenge for the cup. Yeah, that's right. So, Joe Boyle had found himself heavily involved in a hockey team in Dawson City. Uh, there was no uniform arena size at this time, by the way. There were no rules, basically. They, the rules were whatever league league's rules you decided to play in. 
Um, arena size was not limited in any way. They couldn't even decide on offside rules. Hmm. <laughs> um, one of the most common complaints in any hockey game was whether or not the person who made the goal was quote unquote offside. Nobody's actually sure when it became um, allowed within the rules to pass the puck forward. But at this time, it was kind of not allowed. You were supposed to pass the puck back to your team members. Similar to rugby. Yeah. So you could get ahead of them and you could pass the puck back, but you couldn't pass it forward. So if you passed it forward and somebody picked it up, they were considered offside and it was all very confusing. <laughs> right. Um, so Joe Boyle was nothing if not a man of vision. He was convinced that the Dawson teams were some of the best hockey players out there and fully planned to challenge for the cup. And like I said, there was a really big issue in that the cup holders, the Ottawa Silver 7, were in Ottawa. Joe recognized the skill and ability that his team had, however, and truly believed that they could win. So Joe rounded up his team, devised a plan, and they started walking. Before they could do anything else, they had to get to Whitehorse. Uh. To get to Whitehorse today by car takes 5 hours and 40 minutes. Alternatively, you can catch a plane and take a one hour and ten minute flight there. Um, if you were to walk, it would take you approximately 107 hours or four straight days with no stopping. <laughs> Assuming you walk 10 hours every day, it would still take you almost 11 days to get to Whitehorse. The Dawson boys had another issue. They also had to bring along their hockey gear, and it was also December. Um, there was one problem. They had a, a pretty easy solution to bringing their hockey gear, which was dog sleds to haul the equipment and provisions they'd need. But it hadn't snowed. Frank Slavin had just walked from Whitehorse to Dawson because I guess that's what you did at the time and reported that the path to Whitehorse was completely devoid of snow, even though it was already December. This was a problem. The solution? Bicycles. <laughs> oh no. About half the team was going to walk ahead and the other half was going to take bicycles to catch up. Because this is also during an election season. Right. There's a federal election going on. And their star player, by the way, is involved in the elections. He's not getting elected, but he's helping out with the elections. Which created another problem that he was going to have to come even later. But he was such a good hockey player that they were going to shell out for a stagecoach for him to get to Whitehorse. So that he'd be <laughs> able to leave later. <laughs> so the first half of the team set out on December 18th, 1907 um, for, from Dawson for Whitehorse at first light. Following behind were the cyclists a few days later. They had 25 days to make it to Ottawa and they had 4,000 miles to go. The bicycles began breaking down on their way to Whitehorse, but not before the cyclists were able to catch up with the walkers. So, sure enough, all of the players, both cyclists and walkers, made it to Whitehorse at the same time. <laughs> Which is a feat in and of itself. <laughs> from there, they were able to catch a train over to Skagway, and from Skagway, they caught a boat to Vancouver. Around this time, their hockey star, Weldy Young, who had to stay behind to help with the federal election left for Whitehorse by stagecoach. He deposited the electoral list, so the list of the people that were allowed to vote, that he had been preparing. Uh, he was late getting them in and deposited them in just before he left. He was already well on his way to Ottawa by the time the election officials realized that Welby had simply copied the previous electoral list, which had been used <laughs> in the federal vote, 
which had been charged with, quote, vast irregularities. No, no. Welby would never go back to the Yukon after this tour of hockey games. <laughs> he, did, he was disgraced. I, apparently, he was well, a, he, probably, he was originally from Montreal, so I imagine yeah. he moved back to Montreal. But yeah. yeah, apparently, he never went back after this series of hockey games that he was about to embark on. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, the men on the boat in Vancouver were currently praying for death. The team was beset by a serious wave of seasickness. Unlike oh, no. Joe Boyle, who was not with them at the time, the team did not have their sea legs, and they were suffering for it. That said, they were apparently thrilled when they made landfall in Vancouver. They were able to hop on the CPR and arrived in Ottawa, on December 19th, four days ahead of the series that they were having with the Ottawa Silver 7. Hmm. So they arrive. They're all jazzed up. They're exhausted from their trip. But they're all jazzed up. They're ready to play some hockey. They start playing hockey, and apparently the game is an absolute shit show. <laughs> The poor Yukon Nuggets were not prepared for the sound thrashing they were about to receive at the hands <laughs> of the Ottawa Silver 7. I don't know a lot about hockey in the early 20th century. Hell, I don't know a lot about hockey in the early 21st century. But as far as Joe Boyle saw it, the Ottawa team was playing dirty. Almost everybody who had the puck was offside. But the Yukoners gave as good as they got. Supposedly, one of the Yukon boys was cross-checked, and in retaliation broke his stick over the head of one of the Ottawa players, who was then knocked unconscious for ten minutes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is hockey I want to watch. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> this is like the XFL of hockey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when I was a, I was a kid uh, with the early version of the Edmonton Oil Kings, they'd play at the old Edmonton Gardens, which is now uh, the Expo Center. Yeah, it's all been torn down, but the old Edmonton Gardens was our arena, and uh, you know the saying was, this would have been in the early seventies, uh, you go to a fight and a hockey game breaks out. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was our pro team at the time. That, that sounds about like what was going on here. Um, the Yukoners, it was agreed upon by all sides, and even ratified by the Stanley Cup's custodian, were good for about the first 15 minutes of the game. So that's the first 15 minutes of the first half hour, which is the first half of the game. They played halves, not, uh, not periods? Yeah, they played halves. After that... Uh, their exhaustion from the long journey kicked in, along with the fact that they played most of the game one or two men short. They were roundly exterminated, losing... Okay, so first half, game is 10-1. to 1. By the time the game is over, the score is 23-2 to 2 in favor of the Ottawa Silver 7. Ouch. 14 of those goals were scored by one guy who had one eye. <laughs> <laughs> he was their center, a man named Frank McGee, and he had 14 goals in that game, setting a record for the Stanley Cup Challenge era. Um, this game was record-setting in all ways. Apparently, the second half was just an assassination. It was apparently <laughs> like the Yukoners had just stopped skating at that point. Well, they were I just... imagine they got they were gassed by the end of the <laughs> yeah. They were just so minutes, tired yeah. from yeah. their trip. It was an absolute bloodbath, and they went on to tour the country after this. Really? 
Because Joe Boyle had booked them games all across the country on their way back to the Yukon after their Stanley, figuring, I think, that they were going to win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so they didn't win, but how did they do on the rest of the tour? As far as I know, they did decently well. <laughs> the, once, the point... once they were rested. Yeah, exactly. The point really was less that they were going to win and more that they even made it to Ottawa in the first place. Yeah. That, I mean, <laughs> okay, the journey uh, to Dawson from anywhere was considered a feat in and of itself. Yeah. <laughs> to actually come back from that journey and play a hockey game Yep. <laughs> Mostly on foot. Yep. Yeah, it was <laughs> just a totally insane. This is uh I kind of I kind of look at this as like the Jamaican or the the uh hockey equivalent of the Jamaican bobsled team that was immortalized by the wonderful 80s film Cool Runnings featuring John Candy <laughs> with John Candy. A Canadian. Um, it wasn't about whether or not they could win. It was that they made it to the game. <laughs> right. Right. And that is where we're going to leave an offer today. But this is not the end of the story of Klondike Joe Boyle. Tune in <laughs> next week for the tale of how this country boy from Ontario seduces the queen of Romania. <laughs> Oh, awesome. You guys, uh, just before we head out here, you can check us out on Twitter, at Canuckonomicon. Check us out on Patreon. By the way, we got our first Patreon subscriber, um, Norwestern Whispers, a wonderful paranormal podcast. Uh, they're Canadian podcasts, just like us. Um, check them out. So that's Norwestern, Nor apostrophe Western, Mis uh, Whispers. Um and I just want to give a big shout out to them for, for being our first patrons on Patreon at the $5 a month level. At $5 a month, you guys are going to get exclusive content, uh, which I am working on as we speak, just figuring out what I'm going to do with it. It's going to be an exclusive patrons-only podcast that will be releasing one bonus episode a month. Um that one is probably going to be covering topics that don't fit into our main podcast. So stuff that's from outside of Canada, uh, which opens up the door for all sorts of crazy cryptids like the El Puelo, El Puelo, ah, I don't remember what it's called now. The, uh, El Puelo oh. Maligna. <laughs> <laughs> the evil chicken from South America. <laughs> yeah, be Who haunts the jungles. Oh, and may or may not be Satan. So there's all sorts of cool stories that you guys will be able to check out on there. Um, I'll let you know as those episodes become available. I'll probably post a teaser on our main podcast um, so that you guys can get a taste. Just a, a little morsel. Mm -hmm. mm. Yum, it's something to taste. Uh, just like that bag of flies. That, that's uh, right. Mm -hmm. When it's Paltrow's <laughs> munching on. <laughs> Um, if you guys can't afford to give us a payment every month, then please just go check us out on Kofi, uh, ko ficom slash Canuckonomicon and just toss us a little bit of cash here or there. Um, no bonuses. Uh, maybe if you ask me real nice, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do, I'll tell you what, I'll do a shout out on the episode following me noticing that you've donated on ko-fi.com slash canuckonomicon so I'm going to give my first shout out to uh, Todd Wandio who sent me <laughs> two bucks so I bought him a coffee yeah he bought me a coffee on Kofi <laughs> uh, so yeah guys check it out uh, email us if you've got uh, episode suggestions if you just want to talk to me about wrestling uh, canuckonomicon at gmail.com you can also check out Dirty Clyde here on SoundCloud as, uh, I don't know what Todd you're up Wandio. there as. Hmm? Just Todd Wandio. Just Todd Wandio on SoundCloud. So check him mm -hmm. out. He does some awesome kind of uh, prog rocky country music. It's cool. I don't know what it is. I, I, I fail to uh, arrive at a definition of my style. I think that by definition makes it prog rock. <laughs> or indie. 
Indie's or indie. the word for anything that, that you can't <laughs> fit anywhere else. That's right. It's uh, indie. Yeah. Especially when you're mixing prog rock and country. That's like every indie band on earth. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so check him out there on SoundCloud. He does really great stuff. He also does the music for this show. Do we have music for this show yet? <laughs> You know what? I'm working on a way I can do it because none of my uh, digital audio interfaces uh, work anymore. So, oh, that's lame. It, it might be the computer. I just uh, it's just not picking up the signals that is that are being laid down. But <laughs> you'll figure it out. I I will. You know, even if I have to record it, like uh, like a Christmas. plebeian. I'm, well, I'm writing a Christmas song currently, and uh, that's going to be up on SoundCloud uh, probably by the end of the week, and um, and that's all recorded just simply live. So using this mic here that I'm sitting in front of, um, just in various positions around the room, whichever instrument I'm on, and that's how it works. <laughs> there you go. There we go. All right, guys. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Keep your eyes open and remember to write your representative in the House of Commons about why we should invest in nuclear energy. It's cleaner and cheaper mm -hmm. and better in every way. <laughs> That's Gosh. enough of me green pilling you for today. <laughs> Have a great we'll week, everyone. Catch you guys on the next episode. Bye bye. Economicon is a production of Crossing Clay Studios. We can be found on Twitter at Canuckonomicon, and you can contact us through email at Canuckonomicon at gmail.com. Please be sure to share us with your friends and family and keep your eyes open.